Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Beautiful spring day we got outside. <laughs> um, thanks for coming and joining us in church this morning. Um, looking forward to preaching this message um, titled Tools with Fuel. The last message I spoke was um, I had opened with the scripture reading, uh, Daniel 12, 4. And um, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Last time I opened with this, and, um, and we, we looked outward. We looked at how that was affecting the world. This time we're going to go inward. Um, life gets busy. We have distractions. We have our phones on us all the time. There's media, news, politics. And then there's work, school, friends, family, church. A lot of these things are good. Some of them are distractions. But our lives are full, and... When our lives are full, uh, puts us in a state of possibly comfortable in need of nothing. Um, amongst all this, are we careful to reserve adequate time for our personal relationship with Jesus? And then that brings us to the scripture reading today. I wanted to emphasize there, I know you not. As you can see, it's bold at the end. Um, knowing here is indicative of a personal relationship with Christ. We cannot enter into his kingdom without this personal relationship. I don't know about you, but for me, this is one of the most terrifying verses in the Bible, to think you've been living a life for Christ, and then only to get into the end and have your Savior look at you in the face and say, I don't know you. In today's message, we will be contemplating what it means to have a personal relationship with, with Jesus. These verses demand introspection, uh, myself included. I intend to join you on this journey through this message today. When crafting the message, Jesus' teachings on removing the beam from my own eye before I try and remove the speck from another's clearly came to my mind. I think of moments in the Bible when the Lord's followers partake in introspection. In the book of Mark, Jesus mentions betrayal from one of the twelve, and the disciples ask one by one, is it I? Today it is my hope that we can all ask ourselves this question, not in the context of betrayal, but applied to the parable of the ten virgins and our relationship with Christ. Let us consider Jesus' words, I know you not, and ask, is it I? And... That'll take us right into a need of mine, and that's prayer. Bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, uh, I need you to speak through me in this message, knowing that I need to learn from it as well. May your words come through. May you speak to the hearts of the congregation and visitors. May we all be drawn near to you in a saving relationship, looking forward to those days in heaven when you soon come. Praise the Lord in your name, we pray. Amen. So, part one, a deeper dive into a deeper dive into the ten virgins. So, let's open it up. Let's get the full context here. We'll read the full parable. Matthew twenty five, verses one to thirteen. Twenty five, one to thirteen. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, 
For you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So the crux. You may, not, may or may not be familiar with that term. It's a climbing term. Um, the crux of a climbing route is the test. It's the focus. It's the hardest part. Um, it's the rock that if you can get past that, you're going to finish the route. And so what's the crux here in this parable? What divides the two groups, the successful versus the unsuccessful? All had lamps, but the five foolish did not have extra oil. Lamps and oil. A lamp, what is a lamp? Just in general, a tool to cast light in order to see. We look into the word for the definition of a lamp in this context. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. How about the oil? Oil is a fuel to cast light in order to see. Looking back into the word to figure out what that means. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So we're starting to match up the oil with the Spirit here, the lamp to the word. And you'll notice the reference to the title as we begin to unpack this metaphor. Tools with fuel. So, the Spirit. According to the parable of the ten virgins, you cannot enter into the kingdom without this. The Spirit is the crux. It is the oil, the Holy Spirit, that brings function and life to a lamp, or the Word of God, in us. How do we know if we have the Spirit in us? And of course, many of you are familiar with the text that we go to, Galatians 5, 22, 23. These would signify that you have the Spirit by the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, temperance, and against such there is no law. So how do we get the fruit? How do we know that we have the Spirit? So let's read from John 15, 4 to 12. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. So here it's clear that a relationship with Jesus and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit must be present to bring forth the fruit. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is, and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, be you think in word, lamp, spirit, oil, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another, as I have loved you. So why foolish? They have the word of God without the love of God. They, that only comes from an intimate relationship with him, the indwelling of the spirit. So we're starting to put our finger on what is really lacking amongst the five foolish virgins. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. So that's, that's our key word we've been looking at, No. So, what is love shared with God? It's a relationship. How is our relationship with God? Consider Jesus' words, I know you not, and our response, is it I? 
That takes us to part two. The word without the love. Frustrated with Israel's constant drifting away from God's sanctuary truths and his commandments, the religious leaders of Jesus' day had purposed in their hearts to change course and fully commit to his divine ordinances, even adding to it substantially with the hope of securing God's favor for generations to come. This left a hollow religion where works were prioritized and elevated over a close personal relationship to God, both corporately and individually. A large portion of Jesus' earthly ministry was dedicated to addressing this folly of religion in his day, and he would spend significant time with people discussing the issue. He desired to draw people closer to him and a proper balance of the word and the spirit. So there's many places we can go in the Bible to find examples of this, uh, where Jesus is addressing this. We're going to focus on the rich young ruler here. Um, so let's turn to Matthew 19, 16, 22. There are many passions, yeah, okay. So, Matthew 19, 16 to 22. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So right out of the gate, we can see that this man's total misunderstanding of scripture and how we are saved. Understandably so, he is a wealthy man with a life surely filled with merit-based transactions so far. No wonder he would extend this experience to his theology. There's also no doubt that he was influenced by the religious teachings of his day that described such a path of salvation. But how are we saved? John 3.16, right? We all know that. He didn't have the New Testament. How about the Old Testament? Where, where do we go to see the, some of the most clear descriptions of the gospel in the Old Testament? I think of Isaiah 53. We'll look at verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Both the Old and New Testament agree that the salvation transaction is as followed. God gave himself for us. There is nothing we can do to earn it. There is nothing this young, rich young Euler can do to earn it. No merit-based transaction to earn it. Verse 17, And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. So we're starting to get into Jesus' clever and purposeful choice of words here. His truthful words in this conversation are targeted to this man's specific life experience. In this verse, Jesus chooses to describe only one side of the same coin. We can see the other side of this coin is revealed in John 14, 15, where he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Love is the other side of that coin. Love and commandment keeping are one. We cannot keep the commandments as God would have us keep them without love for him first. Verses 18 and 19. He saith unto him, which, Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus' specific wording here is intended to touch this particular man's heart and experience. Take a closer look at what he omits, what he presents, and what he edits. First, the omission. He omits the first four commandments describing love for God. Jesus is proclaiming this through their omission and thereby shows that love for God is exactly what this man is missing. Jesus presents the commandments surrounding love for others with some accurate rephrasing. One edit was thou shalt do no murder. That's not how it reads in, in Exodus. Thou shalt do no murder. The other edit was the commandment on coveting is clarified in more simple words. If you love your neighbor, you will not covet anything of theirs. 
And this also, of course, summarizes all the six commandments focused on our neighbors that he gave to the young man and centers them around the most important element, love. In recognizing Jesus' purposeful oration here, notice that Jesus points to the man's flaw in the belief that he can do something to earn salvation, while also proposing that the very thing he lacks is love. Continuing in verse 20, The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Here we see he missed Jesus' subtlety on the first pass as to what he lacks, but he continues to recognize that he is missing something. Verse 21, Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. Jesus now puts his finger on the love of God here and how love for man is manifested in it. Jesus set aside his throne in heaven, or in other words, sold all that he had to give himself as a sacrifice for the poor in spirit. Here's our connection to the parable of the ten virgins. So I have a question for you. How many of the virgins were poor in spirit again? At first glance, it seems as though the parable indicates that there are five who lacked oil in their lamps, or as we have learned, the spirit in their lives. Let's consider another passage in Matthew where Jesus mentions the poor in spirit. Many of you know it. Someone give it to me. Matthew 5, the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In the parable, who inherits the kingdom of heaven? The wise virgins. The ones with the extra oil, the extra spirit. Is that a contradiction? What's going on here? No. At some point, in the lives of the five wise virgins, before the moments described in the parable, each must have recognized their sad state in a wayward life and desired something more. That something more was the spirit. So at some point in time, all ten virgins were without oil and poor in spirit. For the wise virgins, this early recognition revealed their need for the spirit in their lives, extra spirit, in fact, that would carry them through the end times and into the arms of the coming Savior. Recognition of the lack of a spirit-filled life and a close relationship to God is the beginning of the process of sanctification that is described in the rest of the Beatitudes. Jesus invites the rich young ruler to embark on this journey of sanctification in perfect unison with the closing verse of the Beatitudes, which is, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. He says to the rich young ruler, If you want to be perfect, or in other words, sanctified, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. How would he respond? Verse 22. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. His treasure was on earth, not in heaven. His love for material gain has crowded out any love for God or true love for his fellow man. He thought he was keeping the commandments. But we can see here, that it goes much deeper, as Jesus describes in the Gospels. Is there anything in our own lives crowding out the love of God in a similar way, perhaps the same as him? So why did Jesus leave out the four commandments describing love for God from his list of commandments for the rich young ruler? The love of God is focused on others, specifically the lost and needy, and that is why we are invited to do the same. The young man's answer reveals he does not care for the poor and therefore reveals he has no love for God. It is unnecessary for Jesus to mention the first four commandments. Another point in the beatitude sanctification process is blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. When we are humbled, by our own poor spiritual condition, we will have mercy 
on others and a heart to share God so, so others may also rejoice in his salvation. It is at this point when the saved see Jesus and as the Beatitudes conclude, Jesus considers them his children and heirs to the kingdom of heaven. Just as when the wise virgins, virgins are accepted at Christ's coming in the parable of the ten virgins. Close relationship to Jesus. The five foolish virgins realize they are poor in spirit and it's too late. This parable surrounds the time of the end, Jesus' church in the time of the end. At this point, probation is already closed. It's too late. There is no time for the process of sanctification to draw them near to Jesus. And sadly, a large portion of God's end time church will be lost for eternity for this very reason. Let's ask ourselves again, is it I? Is it I? Brings us to part three. Which is, so how do we know, how do we get to know him? How do we rekindle that love for him or develop it for the first time? And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The glory of the Lord is his character of love, best exemplified on the cross. By beholding, we become changed. By beholding the cross, we become changed. By beholding what Jesus has done for us, we become changed. As we have studied, this matches perfectly with the lack of the Spirit in the parable of the Ten Virgins. We cannot see the true light of the cross without the indwelling of the Spirit. These things, and this is speaking of the vine and the branches parable that comes before these verses, and we, we read in the call to worship and already in the message a little bit, have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full? This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. As we explored today, Keeping the commandments is not something you study and do just as they read. Keeping the commandments is the natural outcome of embracing God's love and leading to self-giving love for those around us. In, the, in these verses here on the screen, I capitalize the H, and this is to emphasize specifically what Christ has done, what Christ's love for us with his sacrifice on the cross. But as it reads in the word, he calls us all to higher selfless love for one another. Giving up portions of our lives we deem precious for others. There's language of relationship here. It's clearly seen in these verses. Remember his words, abide in me and I in you. The hallmarks of relationship here are love, joy, and friendship. If we want to draw near to Jesus in love, joy, and friendship, we need to abide in him beholding what he has done for us. So how do we behold? How do we abide in him? I believe it starts with surrender. It starts and continues through daily surrender to God. He gives the strength to will and to do of his good pleasure. We need to surrender our will. Next one, quality time. Spend purposeful time with him. Let our thoughts wander to him throughout the day. This is going to look unique to each relationship, but some common ways of doing this um, are reading the Bible, clearly, journaling, 
nature walking, we've been talking about that today, meditating on the Lord, contemplating the cross event, and the closing hours of Jesus' life, Ellen White recommends us to do this. Having regular morning devotionals, that's a big one, um, something that I miss sometimes and, and need to get better at. And then I threw another one in here, Sabbath school, coming into church early, getting that extra opportunity to have the Lord speak to you. Highly recommend our Sabbath school. We got great speakers. And many more, many more. I'm sure you can think of many more. Um, but these are just some ways to give quality time to God, draw you near to him, give opportunity for him to speak to you. Next one, routine. Build this purposeful time into a routine that will be shared with him always. Lapses in this routine will signal to us our need to draw nearer to him again. Um, I used to have a pretty good morning devotional routine. Um, at my new job, I start at 5 a.m. now, so I try to set my alarm at 3.30 to give time. Um, there are days when I'm able to, able to get up and, and go through that same routine, and there are days when I hit the snooze button a couple times, and then I roll out of bed, and I'm not really thinking so well, and then all I do before I leave the, my front door is, is read the scripture of the day on my Bible app, and that is not enough to center your day around Christ. So constantly have to stay on top of myself and make sure that I'm getting that morning time with him. Uh, and then considering others. Might be weird to think about that as far as like how we draw nearer to him, but considering others is a clear theme of the love of Jesus. Um, carve some time out of our busy days to spend focusing on the diverse needs of those around us. This could be volunteering, joining a ministry, helping the poor, helping a friend, visiting those who are sick or lonely, visiting people in prison. Jesus says that when we do these things to help others, we are doing them to him and partaking in the same other-centered love that he embodies. So, kind of a, how I've been mentioning throughout the, the message, um, there are times where I think my personal relationship I'm doing really well, and then I think probably the same with many people in here, it kind of goes through an ebb and flow, um, peaks and valleys, and I just wanted to share a moment of one of, one of a, a, peak, a peak in my relationship with God, where I really felt that he was near, and I really felt close in relationship, um, and that it really highlighted that relationship. Um, so I'll tell a little story. This is a couple months ago. Um, one of our, our dogs passed away. She uh, started getting um, seizures one Sabbath afternoon, and then every hour or two afterwards, she would um, have another, another seizure and another seizure and another seizure. She, she had no problems before this. It was just out of the blue. Um, just too many seizures in a row, and, and she was just not herself anymore, totally out of it, um, and we had to make the decision to put her down. Um, so any of you who have lost an animal before, um, a pet, a close pet, would know the kind of pain that, go, that, that, that comes with. And, um, and so that day I was just trying to, you know, wrap up all the, the essentials of having to, to close that out as far as, like, you know, coming home from the vet and, and finding a place in the yard to bury her and all that. So it, if you've been through that before, you know it kind of takes a toll on you. And, and part of my personal relationship with God from the beginning, um, when I first started to walk with him, which was around 2013, 2014, somewhere in there, um, he's always chosen to speak through me through nature. So during this time after I had finished burying her and cleaned up everything, the mess from the seizures and, and all that, um, I just needed to take some time in nature just to get away from everything. And, and clear my mind. So I took our other dog, Nesta, and we went out to Juniper Trail over close to Redmond just to walk around. We went there often. It's kind of our go-to, like, close place if we just want to get out in the, 
in the trees somewhere. Um, so what I wanted to do in particular on this, on this walk was find like a headstone to put over um, where I buried my dog in my yard. And I had in mind this particular type of rock. Um, you've probably seen it around here in people's yards or out and about. It's like a really deep red volcanic lava flow rock. And they come out in like cool twisting patterns. And, and I thought that, that rock would just remind me of her because she her name was Ember and she was kind of a reddish brown color. Um, and I thought it would be a fitting rock for that. So set out with my other dog. We started walking. I was looking all over for this rock and um, started to get discouraged. Wasn't seeing the right type of rock. And um, so I just had a moment where I stopped and just feeling the pain of her passing and not being able to find this rock. Um, I, I, I spoke to the Lord like, okay, I'm done finding, I'm, I'm done trying to look for this rock, Lord. You, you lead me to the rock that you would have me to put on her, on her grave. And um, so I got back on the trail and started walking, and moments later, I feel my eyes drawn to this particular rock right on the side of the path. And this is actually the second um, time in my life where I've had a similar experience with this, with God pointing me to a particular rock to tell me a message. Um, so it is a part of my relationship with him and he uses it again here. Um, so I pick up this rock and um, I should have brought it today so you can see it, but I did not. But this, this particular rock looked um, exactly like my dog Ember, kind of like looking down like this with her pointy ears and an eye right there. And it really focused me like on what he had for me to to contemplate in this moment, and that was, you don't need some big, fancy-looking, cool rock. The important thing here was your relationship with your dog and the love you shared, and this will remind you of her, um, which I thought was special and, and um, definitely had tears in that moment. Um, so I, I mentioned that the, the seizures and, and the oncoming, um, or the onset of this happens super quickly. So like normally, I don't know, in a lot of cases, like if you're having a pet pass away, you can do those last things. You can take that last hike. You can go through the drive through and give them a McDouble or something like that and watch them have the time of their lives eating it and things like that. But I didn't get that here and I didn't get that last hike. So it was kind of weighing on me, but having this rock in my hand, I was able to take that last, uh, that last walk with her. Um, with my other dog, and um, as I started to walk, feeling the weight of it, um, I just called out to the Lord, like, speak to me, comfort me. That's all I said. And at that moment, it started to snow, and the Lord knows that my favorite sound in the world is the sound of smalling, or falling snow, when you're out in the middle of nowhere and it's the only thing you can hear, the flakes hitting each other and the trees. It's a, it's a very faint sound, but it's my favorite sound and, and it is comforting. And um, so the Lord had it snow then. I enjoyed that comfort with him. He answered my prayer immediately. And um, yeah, I was comforted and I took that last walk with my dog in hand. Um, so this, I, I wanted to share this, this testimony, this story of my closeness with God um, because it, it, it really highlights like a personal relationship with him. Um, like I said, I falter often and I need to draw near to him. I have times when I'm far, far away from him or find myself wandering. But this is what I'd like to highlight. Um, we can get caught up in doctrines. We can get caught up in religion. We can debate things, but... This is what our God is like. Our God cares about us. He cares about even our dogs. He knows when a sparrow falls. He loves us more than his own life, which he gave for us. And that's the God I want people to know. That's the God that I want to share with my friends and family um, and those in the community. 
So, wrapping up here. Tools with fuel. So we've talked about just a few ways to draw near to Jesus in part three of this message. To draw near and closer relationship with him, a relationship that will be full of the Spirit. May we be tools with fuel in these closing hours of Earth's history. May we have the indwelling of the Spirit, a close and loving relationship with Jesus. He's coming soon. We need to be ready. As we sing our closing hymn, please join me in self-reflection as we consider how we may have wandered from God and how much he has given us on the cross and how we can draw near to him again.